Well, my friend, Mr. John Edwards. Hey, right here, brother. So yeah. you are the first person in my little setup here in my basement to do in-person interviews. <laughs> yeah, it's awesome, man. I, first of all, thank you. It's a it's a great honor to be the first person to be in here. I didn't think it'd be me, but I'm glad it is. And man, you've got an awesome setup. Like I'm, I'm really impressed. You got a lot of good stuff and you're way more uh, technical, technologically advanced than I am. Well, I, I appreciate that. I feel like it's pretty ghetto. I honestly do. Like I feel <laughs> when when we did our our trip to um, to California, I got to spend some time with my buddy Sean Bryan, who's like a major tech guy with this stuff. Yeah. His studio dwarfs what I'm doing here. And then and then of course you know others that I've been to see. You know I'm thinking of you know of course um, in Steubenville with Matt, seeing all the setups, all the different things. And I remember coming home from from our trip, just going, I got to up my game. And <laughs> by up my game, I mean buy some fake panels on my wall and <laughs> a couple cameras and move some stuff around. But I have a background in photography, so I understand sure. lighting and things. But yeah. it's good. I'm, I'm looking forward. I just get tired of, honestly, doing video interviews. Like, And you and I have done a couple of sure. those. Sure, oh, yeah, yeah. So I'm thankful for those in the sense that we can connect. Yeah. But this is way better. I mean, you and I just spent – Hour and a half just hanging out. Oh, sure. You know, having some nice bourbon, by yeah, the way. Yeah, well, you did. I'm doing Exodus, <laughs> so I wasn't right. doing that. That's why but, I don't do Exodus. Yeah, oh, I'm just kidding. Yeah. <laughs> I'm just I kidding. had my non alcoholic Coors Edge or whatever. It was disgusting. Yeah, no, I've uh, done Exodus before, and it's it's great. And I just, this Lent, I, I chose a couple other different things to do and that. But man, I enjoyed having that Blanton's you gave me a sip well, of hey, there, man, so Thank you. I, I'm happy that you got to take I'm glad that I, I lived vicariously through you. But, but th <laughs> this is what I'm talking about. You yeah. know, it's like, this type of fellowship of gathering together, and you know, we hear that we hear it said a lot, like "be the church." But sure. this is what I'm talking about when I hear stuff like that. And with a lot of the ministries that we all do, we're so far apart from each yeah. other, we're so separated. So we have those opportunities, and you're here for a conference. Yep, speaking so, of the Archdiocese of uh, Dubuque's men's conference tomorrow, yeah. yeah. And you're emceeing I'm now. The, I got, I'm the MC. That happened yeah. at the last minute. They they were like, <laughs> the guy we really wanted uh, was sick. So <laughs> yeah. I'm like, I don't yeah. know who really wanted, the guy that said yes probably. but <laughs> Well, I'm just pumped because I got my 40 bucks back to register for the conference. So there you go. They hooked me up. <laughs> well, I'm excited you're a part of it, man. It's going to make it even better than it already was going to be, man. Well, plus I'm making some barbecue tomorrow too. Oh, which, dude. I told you, a guy from Memphis, World Championship Barbecue, capital of the world, man. So you're you're a brave guy. Yeah, but I'm cooking pork, so that's, that's an right. Iowa thing. That's so right. So we're having a pork butt tomorrow night, so it's going to be great. So it's great yeah. to have you here. Yeah. Um, you've been on my my channel a couple times, John. Yeah, you've been on mine too. And yeah, yeah and and you know, I just love what you what you're doing, and I, I do want to get in for people that don't know you. I want to mm -hmm. I want to give people an opportunity to hear your story, but because. People love to hear conversion stories. Yeah. But sometimes they're just like, yeah, okay, that's great. But because I want them to hear about your ministry, what you're doing now, sure. let's talk for a minute about that. And mm -hmm. then we're going to get into your story, which I promise you guys will not want to miss John's <laughs> conversion story. <laughs> yeah. So indulge us in a few minutes to hear about it. Because I think what you're doing is is incredible. So you run a ministry called Just Another Guy in the Pew. Just a guy in the Pew. Just a guy yeah. in the Pew. Yeah. Okay. Tell yeah. us about what that's about. Yeah, so it started off as a podcast, um, and we've been doing that since 2018. Uh, it, you know, me and Victor, we all, my co-host, we always joke he's one of my best friends. And in the beginning, we thought, well, it'll be your mom and my mom and dad or whatever listening to this. And now we've been listened to in, in 140 countries around the world, and had just a lot of people following us. And it's just a, a podcast where guys get together and we talk about everyday things. The, the tagline for it actually is. Welcome to the pew, the place where everyday guys talk about everyday things in front of the one person that could do something about it, Jesus Christ. And Amen. we get real, we talk about the faith, but we also talk about our own struggles. So that's the podcast, and that's been going on since 2018. We've got about 300 episodes. We've got a YouTube channel now where you know, we have a studio, too, that Matt's you know, friends helped me uh, set up, Matt Frad, a couple of years ago. So enjoy doing that. But the crux of our ministry, the main part of our ministry now, is going into parishes and building life-changing, vibrant ministry to men. Um, you know, the Lord called us into that. I just felt like I'm never going to be a guy that writes a book on revelations. I'm never going to be, you know, some of these other things, but what I've been able to do through the, the pain and the things I've gone through in my own life, I can understand just the silent suffering that's going on out there with men, especially guys that have been told their whole life to put their head down and never complain and work hard and don't have feelings and be a one man army, pull yourself up by your bootstraps. And what that does is make you go. Uh, into the interior life, and generally you don't share with anybody else. Mm. 
And you wind up finding yourself in all these vices that so many men do today. And this is why men are not involved in the church, because they're out pursuing the things. Like, my worth is found in what I can do or what I can achieve or how many promotions I get or the type house or car I have. And they bought into that as their only sign of worth versus being a beloved son of God where your true worth comes from. So, so many men are on that path. And, you know, we started a men's group, uh, you know, eight years ago in my parish. And that's all I was trying to do. We were real. We were vulnerable. We were authentic. We started sharing about our lives. Guys started looking at each other in the face and saying, I love you. I got your back. Like in a manly way, not sitting around just, you know, being weird, but guys that are really opening up and realizing that, man, being a man is not trying to white knuckle a steering wheel of your life, doing it by yourself, but walking with other men, building relationships, not first and foremost with Jesus Christ, and then with each other and strengthening each other through that. So we go around the country now. We do parish missions. We're called the Restored Parish Mission. We train leaders in parishes before we ever get there. So if a priest calls and says, John, we're interested in this, he finds me six to eight guys. We start training them on Zooms before we ever get there. Then we'll go give a three-talk parish mission for the men and women of the parish. We'll do an in-depth training there and give them a three-month schedule of these different nights to run. So we don't do just the kind of show up and watch a video thing. We have four different nights. We meet every Wednesday night, and we have a formation night, a worship night, a service night, and a fellowship night. So you're you're really building a place where the wholeness of a man can be reached. And you're fishing with four different baits. I'm a bass fisherman, man. So Ooh. my son's always complaining. We go fishing. He takes one pole. I take six with six different lures, <laughs> and I, I'll catch him every time. I'll fish him, and he always wants to know why. Well, because if they're not biting this, they'll bite that. And for too long, we've kind of built these places. They're like, hey, let's get together and talk about the Summa. Well, a guy that doesn't even read the Bible and doesn't have a relationship with Jesus is never showing up to that. I don't belong. I'm convicted of my shame. But if you go and throw an ax with some guys, he can walk in and go, man, these are guys just like me, and work their way backwards through that stuff. So that's how we spend most of our time is, yeah, we're doing the podcast and all those things, but we're really partnering with parishes to build this new type of men's ministry that's being really successful, giving them a structure and a leadership model and letting them and the Holy Spirit build it into what it needs to be in their parish. So what it sounds to me like is you're more of a consultant, really, yeah. than you are a guy who comes in and gives a talk. Yeah, yeah. There's, there's a lot more going on than, hey, I'm going to come speak to your church about men's stuff and, you know, pat you guys on the butt and hope you do well, but then sure. I'm out of here and I'm moving on to the next thing. You're you're meeting with these leaders ahead of time. You're training, so you're you're basically almost in some ways, kind of a staff member, yeah. sort of on that church. You know, obviously very specifically focused, but you're there way before you show up. Sure. From that standpoint, which I think is is something completely different. I've never heard of anybody else doing that before. Now I'm a convert, so I don't know everything how all sure, this other yeah. stuff works. <laughs> but I've I've never heard of of another ministry quite like this that's going to come in work with leaders, train them, and then when you leave, you're not just walking away. You've, you're setting them up with this plan yeah. so that it's like plug and play, go for it. Yeah, and that's what I started to realize was and where this all started really with the men's group stuff was I was going to conferences and I was sharing yeah. my story because I do have a crazy conversion story. We're going to get to that in a yeah. minute. Yeah. And, <laughs> and so people were like, come tell your story, come tell your story. And I love doing it. But I was leaving my wife and my three children at home and I wasn't making very much money at the time, not to support my family at all. I mean, I might have been making four hundred dollars to go, you know, talk, be gone for two days, and meanwhile, my wife with a full time job and three kids is trying to hold all that down. So I was leaving a conference one time, and I was in the airport. I was on the west coast somewhere. It's been several years ago, but I called my wife, or she called me to see how things were going, and I just said, you know, hey, it went great, like it always did. Like I tell my story and guys come up and say, my dad was your dad, or or I went to confession for the first time in forever, or I'm going to change my life. And she goes, well, if that's the case, why do you sound so down? Hmm. And I said, Angela, because I wonder what's going to happen to him on Monday, right? Like I keep flying into these places and, and me and, and you and a lot of other people that go to these conferences, you go and you give these incre incredible talks and you share your life. And it really are these, it, it really is a watershed moment for people. And and they go shooting up the Jesus roller coaster. But as you and I know, I, I was a participant in conferences for a long time before I was ever a presenter. And there were many times when I was in the midst of my struggles where I was going to change my life, but Monday morning hit, all my problems hit, and all the Jesus stuff went away in a few minutes, right? Mm. So it was gone. So what I started saying to my wife was like, I just, 
I don't know, something's missing. And I asked her, well, how are things going at home while I'm not there? She goes, well, Jacob got in trouble, had a wreck, the toilet <laughs> exploded. And I was like, do you want me to quit? And she goes, no, John, I just want fruit that lasts. And Keith, that was something that was in my heart that I'd been trying to put words to that I couldn't. And so I get on this plane. I said, all right, Lord, I got three hours, fruit that lasts. What does that mean? Well, St. Paul is now the patron saint of our ministry. I started hearing his name in prayer, and I was a good Baptist you know, growing up. I'm yeah. a convert, too. I read the Bible five times before I was 15. And so I opened up his, his letters and said, I don't, I don't see anything. And then I thought, well, maybe it's not about what he said. It's about who he was. And Paul, he had this radical conversion. Barnabas grabbed him by the hand, and they went out, and they started building community where there was no community. And that's what I started to see was we have a lot of content in the church and beautiful, like beautiful, wonderful content from guys like you that have just this desire to unpack the mass or things like that that you're doing that these groups can use. But the thing is, if there aren't groups, yeah. there's nobody to use it. And the reason there aren't is because guys have never been shown how. The church has always kind of said, oh, you want something? Well, here's a DVD set. You know, good luck. Get some donuts, put out some chairs, meet at six in the morning. And then we go, well, why aren't there young people here? Why aren't most of the men in the church involved? Because you could sit at home and watch a video. What people are looking for is, I want to be seen, I want to be heard, I want to be loved. I want to be known. They want to belong. And our churches are supposed to be field hospitals. But unfortunately, if you walk into most of them, there's nothing for men. And, and so we want to be part of changing that, not to own things. These aren't just a guy in the pew groups. This is, hey, call yourself forged. Call yourself men who say the rosary standing on their head. Like, call yeah. yourself whatever you want. But we're going to give you a structure. We're going to give you a leadership model and give you a foot up so the Holy Spirit can really take over this with your with your submission and, and your belief in it and, and build something wonderful. Man, that, that gets me going. <laughs> that gets me going because, you know, I used to be a youth pastor for mm -hmm. a long period of time. And what everybody under what everybody wishes they knew about youth ministry was that it's not about the content specifically. Yeah. And I don't want to say one's as good as the next, but at the end of the day, you can have the perfect video series, or the perfect sermon, or the perfect whatever. But if there's not a, a a structure in place to facilitate relationships, I remember one yeah. of the things that I learned was that, and this 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 was hard for me because I am a content guy. Okay. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And one of the I went through this this training for this a long time ago, and they told us that the average person decides within the first seven minutes of coming to something if they're going to come back. Yeah, and that's before I've ever even talked. That's before I've said a word, before the band played a song or whatever, because people get that sense when they walk into a group immediately of is this a place I belong? Yeah, is Amen. this a place I can connect? And the most important factor in whether a young person, I would say it's probably the same thing with a, with a man, yeah. whether or not someone's going to stick with with something like that, is there another person they can connect with? Sure. Because like you said, especially in an age of YouTube and videos, everything, if all you want to do is consume content, you can do that on your own. Sure. But that's not what we're here to do. And and to, to get someone to stick with something requires that, just the template but it's amazing to me, John, how many how many people don't know how to do that? Yeah. We, we, we make it so complicated, but really it's not that complicated. Well, we don't. In the in church, look, we both have been in, in, in uh, another form of Christianity. We've been Protestant. Now we're Catholic. I can tell you that the Catholic Church is not very good at accompanying people, right? If you even look at RCIA, for instance, a lot of people go in, they say, what are you here for? I want to marry him. I want to marry her. You come into it, and then you start talking about what the rules and regulations are. But they never really start with the relationship with Jesus, yeah, right. And when you hear that, people were like, "Oh, that's that's a Protestant thing." Well, where do you think they got it from? From us, exactly. And when you don't start with that 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 relationship, then you lose people. It, we travel all over the country. You and I both. I go to parish. I go to parishes at least twice a month, and every single one of them, I walk in, and no one speaks to me. And I'm the guy on the poster, mm -hmm. right? Like I'm the guy that's here that they're supposed to hear. And nobody speaks to me. Nobody like says hello until they realize, okay, you're the guy here to speak. But I'm six foot eight. Like I know they see me. It's not like they didn't see me. This was the experience I had in the church when I first came in. We were going to five different ones to find a home, and Angela kept asking me because she was a cradle Catholic. She's the reason I became Catholic. She goes, well, what about this one? What about this one? What about this one? And I go, uh, no, 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 and no. And she goes, why? And I go, no one talked to me. Mm. We went to five churches. No one said a word to me. Like, I'm not used to this. Like, when are people going to speak to you? When are people going to greet you? When are people going to act like they want you to be here? Yeah. 
Yeah. And that's the thing. So when our men, when we teach men's ministry and how to do it, the first thing we always talk about is earning the right in somebody's life, right? Becoming a friend. It's that kind of Curcio model. Make a friend, be a friend, bring a friend to Christ. It's not, hey, you're a guy and I have a men's group. You're a piece of meat. I need some more notches on my belt. So you come and be in part of this. So Father sees this big group number of guys and I look like I'm successful. That's yeah. about you. What it is is, man, we're going to build a place where people that are hurting, where people that are doing well, where people that want Paul and Timothy relationships can come into this place and feel at home. Yeah. And it's not about what you know, what you don't know, what you've done, what you haven't done. It's about like we're all, everyone's welcome, and we're going to love you in, in your in your mistakes and celebrate you with you in your joys, and we're going to help each other move along in the face so that we can be the husbands, brothers, fathers, and sons that we all want to be. Because we. You know, the, I, I love watching the Discovery Channel, and you'll see all these, like, gazelles running. And then there's the one that just kind of wanders off. Yeah. And it's like Peter says, right? The devil's like a roaring lion. And he just takes that 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 gazelle out. Mm. That's what happens to men because we've been told our whole life to do it ourselves. So we kind of wander off. I don't need God. I've got money in the bank. I've got a beautiful wife. I've got decent kids. I've got a 401K. So we stop worrying about the faith. And we start we we start diving into all this other stuff and go into the comfort of the world versus the love of God. And then the devil gets in that. He starts preaching against our identity as beloved sons. We start believing the wrong things. We start believing we're God. And that's why you see so many addictions and all this stuff. And so many people are in that place and don't know how to get out of it because as a church, we don't have those places for them. We don't. And we called six over 600 parishes in the last couple of years. Do you have anything for men? No, we don't. 86% of them said no. Wow. 86%. And we ask them why. They go, I don't know. And the three reasons we found, father wants one, but he's too busy. He's by himself. He's understaffed. He's trying to raise money to pave the parking lot. He's administering the sacraments. He's not going to start something that he doesn't feel is going to last or that he has to see to. Who wants to start something and see it fail because they can't give their time to it? So he doesn't. Two, men want something, but I'm convicted of my shame. I don't know my faith. I'm going to stick out like a sore thumb. You don't know what I've done. I still struggle with porn. God can't use me. Like Moses, I stutter and all the other ones mm -hmm. in the Old Testament. God can use anybody. That's the second thing. And the third is finally, I'm a foreign guy. I can I can quote the Summa backwards and forwards. I can, I can, uh, I've got Chesterton memorized, whatever you want to say, but I don't know how to run a men's group. And so it doesn't get done. It's, it's a problem we have in the world today. Everybody's going, well, when's somebody going to do something about this? When is the world going to go back to being influenced by Christianity again? You know, when is somebody going to do something? When are you? Right? When are you? God gave you gifts, and, and he gave you the opportunity to go into your parents and do something. So many men feel like they're in, they're incapable. I don't have a theology degree. I, I just said yes to the Lord, and he started using mm. that yes. And so what I'm trying to do, through, or what the Lord's trying to do through our work, is empower men to go, you can do more. And we can help you, and you don't have to be afraid. And look, to be a man doesn't mean walk in a room and alpha dog everybody and act like you're the baddest guy on the planet. We're all we're all inside. We say we're fine, but we're not. We struggle. It's yeah. okay to admit that. Yeah. Spend that time admitting that instead of trying to put on the facades that you're something else. Yeah, that's that's huge. That's huge. And I, I think I think of so many guys. I mean, one of the one of the things that's most tragic for me is. And it was like this before I became Catholic, but I've, I've seen it in the Catholic Church, too, is you look out in the pews and you see these young moms with their kids and dad is just nowhere. Yeah. He's physically not there. And you go, well, where is he? And what's happened is church has turned into this thing for women. Yeah. And, I mean, don't get me wrong. We're glad for that. But yeah. If not for them, we wouldn't be here probably. <laughs> exactly. After. But it, it seems like why we don't see more men active in church I don't think it's necessarily because they don't believe in God yeah. or they don't have a need for it or whatever. I think it has a lot more to do with they don't know their place. Yeah. They don't know what what am I supposed to do? Am I supposed to show up and, and is my job in the church to make pancakes? Is it to um, clean stuff? Yeah. And uh, or you know physical labor. Yeah. Yeah. Is it kind of like what? Because because you know men want to accomplish things. So and what I've what I've also recognized is. Men don't have patience for their time being wasted. Sure. So if they feel like something's going to be a waste of my time, they're they're not going to give it much chance. And if you, you get like one shot with some of these guys, they yeah. show up for something. If it's lame, they're done. They're not coming back. Yeah. So so I think that that's something too we have to be 
be aware of. So I'm just really impressed with with what you guys are doing. How's it been going out there? Like what? Like yeah. tell us some stories <laughs> of how this has been working. Yeah, it's been awesome, man. I, like I, I really thought, you know, you're in ministry. I mean, you, you put something out there. You don't know if people are going to hear about it. Know what you're doing. We've just organically grown, and we've started almost 30 groups around the country in the last couple of years. And these are groups that, like churches that had nothing, or they were guys that said, well, we used to do this thing, and people quit coming. Um, we need help, and we revitalize it. it. It's just been amazing. We were in Gainesville, Florida uh, back in January, worked with that parish for three or four months. The pastor was bought in, went and did a mission for men and women. We wound up training 17 leaders before I ever got to the parish. 17 men said, I want to be a part of this. So they broke up, and, and like four of them saw to the formation night, four of them saw to the fellowship night, four of them saw to service and worship. So not, there wasn't one guy that was bearing all the load, which was me in the very beginning. I got mad at my men's group and wanted to quit because I was like, I'm doing everything. You guys show up to consume and then go home, and you complain if you don't like it. Like, I, that wasn't a great video. I'm sorry, what did you do to, you know, <laughs> did you pick it? I don't remember you being on the phone and going, you should pick this one. So I would get frustrated. I knew that was a problem. Now you're building these teams of men. So that pair said 17 men st show up to be leaders. We trained them. We did in-depth after the mission. They had 350 people come to the mission, and they have 70 guys meeting a week now in their parish. Wow. Well, they had nothing. They had, the, the, they had the nights, but it was the typical thing, and I love the nights. They The the founder would probably roll over in the grave if he saw them just doing all the service stuff because that's not what it was meant to be, and they're trying to change that through their new core initiative. But a lot of times, it's just exactly what you said. It's service. You let me put a spatula in your hand and an apron, and you go out there and do that, and that's your role in the church. But the thing is, our role is so much more than that. We're supposed to be the priest of our, our families, of the church, of the world, and and dude, the, the, the statistics show this. When the father is leading the family, 93% of families stay Catholic. When it's just the woman, and I don't mean that just in like a derogatory way, yeah. but when it's the mother, the grandmother, the aunt, the sister, it's 17%. And when it's not that, it's 3.5% if it's just the kids trying to do it on their own. So guys go, what do I matter? In a world that tells you you don't because masculinity is toxic and we don't need it. So be a man, but don't be a man. It's confusing. Yeah. And so men simply just check out, go, I don't know what to do, so I'll just go make money, and I'll do that stuff, and I'll give all my passion into a sports team, or I'll throw it into a hobby instead of where it should go to lead the family. And this is why we have children walking away from the faith. Mother, The mother and father are supposed to come together like two hands. It's generally about the mid-teen years. The kids latch on to mom. She's the embodiment of the Holy Spirit growing up. But then they start to get to that age where, okay, it's time to grow up. It's time to you know be an adult. They naturally look to the father. And if the father's checked out or his his passions are in work and money, all those things, that's where those kids are gonna go. They're not gonna they're gonna fall off in the gap because those hands never interlock together. Mm -hmm. And that's what's happening to the faith. And men just think there's no place. I've always done this because my parents always did, my grandparents always took us. We have kids, so maybe some semblance of morality will rub off on them if we take them to mass, but they're not engaging. And this is why we live in the world that we do. Because men have a certain place and a role that has been really checked out. And yeah. this is why we find ourselves in a place because we're not standing guard like we're supposed to. So, John, it's clear to me that all of this passion that you have for men's ministry, it, it's it's not just some random thing that you decided you liked one day. Yeah. It's clear to me that you have personal skin in this game. You have a stake in this game as a husband, as a dad, as a man, obviously. Yeah. So tell us about where that comes from and how you got to this point in your faith journey where you even care about what men are doing in the Catholic <laughs> Church. Yeah, well, I mean, it's, it, you know, this ministry really came out of the place that I was in my life. Yeah. I mean, when I was a kid, I grew up in Memphis. That's where I live now. Uh, I was born and raised Baptist. Two parents from the middle of Mississippi that fell in love, got married. They were Baptist. They moved to Memphis for jobs. It was the biggest town around. Um, went to an Episcopal school because it was in the neighborhood. And they didn't have the best public schools around. So my parents worked to send us there. But every day I was in the Baptist church, every day growing up. I mean, I was going to mission trips and centrifuges and vacation Bible schools. I wanted to be a youth minister. And I was that way until 18. Then all my friends left. They all went to, their parents went to SEC schools. So basically my dad went to Alabama. I want to go to Alabama. And all those schools are within six hours of Memphis. So all of a sudden my community was gone. So first time in my life I was alone. I enrolled in the in, I enrolled in the University of Memphis and just started going to school and working and school and working. I was the loneliest I've ever been in my life. Well, 
Finally, I remember there was one guy that was three years older than me still in Memphis, and he was going to the same university. And he'd always helped me in my life when I changed schools or got into a different age group at church. He always kind of let me hang around. So, and oddly enough, his name was Christian. But he was uh, he was the Rush chairman for a fraternity when I called him. And he goes, man, come out to this thing. Rush is starting next week. We like you. You like us. We'll give you a bid, and then you can find friends in your life. I never really drank that much in high school, just a little bit. I, I was an athlete, played basketball. But I get in the fraternity, and the day that I accepted that bid was the last day that I went to church for 11 years of my life. Wow. My Baptist church was uh, was on the, uh, the high end of age, right? So youth group, nothing, parents at Sunday school. Yeah. So at 18 years old, it's like, I, what do I do now? I don't want to go to Bible school to study with my parents. So I stopped going to Sunday school and just started going to the sermon, to the service, and then that was it. So I'm going to school, doing all this stuff. I joined the fraternity. I walk away from my faith, um, and I had father wounds that I didn't realize at the time. My dad was very, he was raised on a farm. His parents didn't love each other. I didn't hear a lot of them, I'm proud of yous or I love you growing up. So looking back on it now, I see the father wound I had. So I look for affirmation in everybody. I had the wounds of inadequacy that we all as men have from the garden, right? You will toll by your brow and it's never good enough. Mm. So I had that going on in my life. I was trying to find my father's love in other people. So I got in the fraternity, started hanging around these guys. Next thing you know, I was like, well, I'll do what they're doing because I want to be a part of them. Sleeping around, drinking all the time. I did every drug you could think of, every pill, acid, ecstasy, all of that, and then made a huge mistake in my life to do cocaine one night. That followed me through 17 years of my life. Mm. Um, made promises I wouldn't buy it, I wouldn't have the guy's number. All that stuff fell. At the main, This is how I really know where men are. At the same time, I was I had moved up in this company I worked for, and I was a, I was a Fortune 250 salesman of the year. I was making over two hundred thousand dollars a year by the time I was twenty four years old. Dropped out of school, so I had all this money. I was a chameleon among men. Everybody was like, "Oh, that guy's got the tiger by the tail. He's got the house, the car, the money." I had a huge drug problem. I was addicted to porn. I drank all the time. One day, God sent this beautiful girl into my life out of the blue. I wanted to tell her the truth because I knew that I I just, there's something different about her, but I was afraid if she found out, she'd leave me. So we dated for a year, continued to do all these drugs without her knowing. Uh, one day I, I say, we start talking about getting married. She tells me the guy she's going to marry is going to be Catholic. So I thought I was the man for the <laughs> job. So I chivalrously gave up my faith. I didn't practice anymore for hers and went to the closest RCA class and signed right up. But I never told her the truth because I was afraid she would leave. I was doing cocaine until 7 in the morning the night before we got married. Um, my son, a, a, a few months after being married, she says, I'm pregnant. I want to tell her that I'm doing drugs because obviously I was doing it when we conceived, and I was worried something might be wrong with my son, um, but I was afraid. So hold on a second. Yeah. You were you were doing cocaine yeah. up until 7 o'clock in the morning on the day of your wedding. Like, I've seen those prank videos where yeah. the guy pretends to be drunk, and then his wife freaks out, and then he's like, oh, it was a big joke. Yeah. Well, uh, I've never done cocaine before, yeah. John. What is what does that do to you on the day of your wedding? Are you just like <gasps> well, completely tweaking out the whole well, day? First of like, all, you're worn out because you didn't sleep. Okay. Right? So, I mean, at that point in my life, I was used to a lot of the effects. I was nervous about getting married. I was nervous about all this stuff. I loved my wife, but I was just, dude, I was, that's what drugs do. Like, we're all so naturally self-centered and selfish because of the fall. But when you throw addictions in there, it puts it into overdrive. So I was just thinking, I'm going to sit up here and have one more beer and one more this. I'm going to smoke one more cigarette because I smoked at the time. And next thing you know, my brother-in-law was out there with me. Now, he didn't know I was doing the drugs. He goes inside, and I finally go into bed when the sun's coming up. So I sleep for a few hours, get up, head to the church, and I'm exhausted, man. Like, you look at my wedding pictures, and I've got, like, huge bags under my eyes. And, and it was a beautiful day. I, I loved being there with my wife. But... Yeah, man. Like I just was about myself, and she couldn't tell. No, like, she had no idea. She had no idea because I would never do enough of it around her yeah, wow. for her to tell. I would do enough that I kept the feeling to feel okay, but I would never do enough to like where my jaw was popping around or my eyes were all my pupils were dilated. Man. I just hid that from her, and I always thought like like Saint Paul says, it's time for to put childish things away. Yeah, I always just thought life would happen to change me. Like, oh, it's time to get married. I'll stop. Someday it all. I'll, yeah. I'll grow out of this. I have a son who yeah. I wanted more than anything because my dad wasn't always the dad I wanted to, him to be. He taught me how to play basketball, but he never played with me. Mm. He never had time yeah. with me. Right? Everything I did was wrong. So I thought when I have a kid, especially if it's a boy, and hope it is because I don't know what to do with a girl. Like, then I'm going to be the best dad ever. 
and I was when I wanted to be, but it was only, it was very rarely because my life became about money and prestige and notoriety and all this stuff, which so many men fall into. That's why I spoke about it earlier when we're talking mm -hmm. about groups. So shortly after that, my mother had had breast cancer for five years. She'd been in rem remission, never been to a doctor's appointment with her. This one day I'm driving around my sales ter ter territory and I feel called to go to this doctor's appointment. She was up in Memphis. They had started to retire. They built a retirement home down where they came from. And they were in the process of selling their house in Memphis. So I just remember she had an appointment. I go, I'll, I'll just go over there and say hi. So I go in there. My mom's going nuts because I'm never at anything for her. I'm, I'm running out of Christmas dinners and because I got to get back to the party. And I'm talking to her. She's so happy. And then this doctor walks in and says, you must be John. It's nice to finally meet you. Mm -hmm. I'm sorry it's now. but um, And she turned and looked at my mother and said, Miss Edwards, uh, you know, I'm sorry to tell you this, but it's moved from your breast to your lymph nodes, to your lungs, to your brain, and you've got two weeks to a couple, you know, to a month to live. Oh, my gosh. So my dad, who had, like, no emotional capability at all, you know, I walk in the room, he's like, mm, son, you know, it's that kind of thing. He starts crying. never seen that in my life. My mom's like an angel. She accepts it. We go to my parents' house in Midtown. They're going to get clothes to go to the farm. And my dad goes in the house, and my mom's still in the car, and I just fall on her lap, and I start crying. You know, I'm like, Mom— I, I don't want you to die. You know, I don't, I don't want you to die. I don't want this to happen. This doesn't make sense. This isn't right. And she just was sitting there rubbing my hair when I had hair. It's probably why I don't have it. She rubbed it off. But anyway, she, <laughs> she's sitting there rubbing my head. And, and she said, it's okay. I know Jesus, John, and I love Jesus, and I'm going to be with him. And we knew this could happen. And I was so mad, man. I just, I said, I, I don't want to hear that, right? Like, I don't want to hear that excuse. You know, I, I don't want to hear that. It's not going to be okay. Jacob, he's not even a year old. He's never going to know you. And if I have other kids, they're not going to know you. And I need you. And all this stuff, and it was me, 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 I, I, I. This woman's dying. Just found that out. And I'm talking about me and what I need. Wow. So they leave to go down to the farm for to retire, you know, to, to spend the weekend trying to figure things out. And I just remember walking over this porch and kicking it as hard as I could and looking up at the sky and saying, God, I hate you. Mm. I hate you. Like, if this is the God you are, if you're going to leave a lying scumbag, scumbag drug addict like me here to live and take someone who has served you as impeccably as my mother, I don't want anything to do with you. I hate you. Double bird, F-bombs. I'll never serve you again in my life. I go home. I tell my wife, you know, what's going on with my mom. I have to call my sisters because my mother asked me to. Hardest thing I've ever done. Call in and tell my sisters my mother was going to die. Dude, I went off the rails after that. Uh, I started doing $40, $50 worth of cocaine a night. I was drinking 20 or 30 beers a night. I had customers. I was 100% commission salesman. They were wearing me out at night, and it just kept fueling the anxiety to drink. And Angela comes to me and goes, I'm pregnant, which I couldn't believe because we were like ships passing in the night. We were never intimate in any way, emotionally, physically, anything. And, you know, one of those times we were, and she was pregnant, and she tells me we have twins. So I'm sitting here thinking, Angela's in her mid-30s. She's got a medical condition that she was having to go to the doctor all the time. And I'm sitting here wanting to tell her again, right? Yeah. And I'm afraid. I'm a coward. She's going to leave, take everything, the money, the house, probably the way I put it at that time. So I never say anything. And uh, the babies are born. They're healthy. I have two identical twin, redhead, blue-eyed girls. Jacob's healthy. 14 and 11 are the air ages. But I sit there, and I was going off the rails, and, dude, I would sit there till 2 o'clock in the morning every night doing drugs, drinking. Angela would go to bed when she put the kids to bed. She's like, I don't even. And she, I had the perfect cover because she thought You're he working. just doesn't know how to deal with No, she didn't mm. thought I didn't know how to deal with my mother's death. Oh. So he's just drinking because that's all she sees, and he'll eventually get over it and move on. But I also addi uh, adopted addiction to, por to pornography then, too. So I'm sitting there till every every night till 2 in the morning watching some ESPN baseball replay that I wasn't really watching in case she came up there doing drugs, drinking, and watching porn. So one night I get up and I go to bed. It's 2 in the morning. I lay down. All of a sudden, the heart, my heart starts blowing out of my chest about 10 minutes after I went to sleep. I wake up. I'm going, no, 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 no. This is it. This is it. I'm going to die. I'm going to die. This is an overdose. This is what this is what the after-school specials show you. you yeah. know what? I fall out of the bed. I hit the floor. Somehow she didn't wake up. We had carpet. I crawled to the bathroom, and I pulled myself up on the commode, and I'm just going, I'm going to die. This is it. And I wanted to call out to her, but I was afraid to. I thought if she, if I call out to her, she's going to call an ambulance. They're going to take my blood, mm -hmm. and then that she'll find out what's going on. She'll take the kids and the money and the house and everything, and I'll be ruined. So I just grabbed a towel, and again, being a coward, and said, if, I'll die, if I'm going to die here, at least I'll, I'll die quietly. And I put the towel to my face. Next thing you know, my breathing slowed down. I started realizing I was in panic. I was having a panic attack. Mm. 
So I crawl back into bed, said, dude, I'm done. I'll never do it again. Get up in the morning, throw out the drugs. I'm back buying the booze and the drugs at 4.30 the next day. Same thing happens. Two in the morning, in the bed, sit up, heart blowing out of my chest, fall on the floor, crawl to the bathroom, pull myself up in the commode. And this time I'm going, all right, I need to call out to God, but I hated him and I was I was obstinate. I was stubborn. I was like, no, I blame you for my mother's death. I knew there was a men's conference coming up in Memphis, like the one I'm going to speak at tomorrow. Mm -hmm. And I knew one thing. I'd been to confession one time in 11 years. But I remembered you could tell somebody the truth and they can't tell anybody. And that's what I wanted to do more than anything in my life was to tell people the truth, somebody the truth. And so I go to this conference. I find this priest. I pour everything out. He gives me. He's about to give me absolution. And I said, I, I want to be the husband and father I should have always been, but I don't want to get in trouble. And, man, he lost it. He's like, what do you mean you want to get in trouble? You don't get to tell Jesus how he delivers his mercy? And he's yelling at me. Finally gives me absolution. I feel the Holy Spirit in my life for the first time in forever, and I made it four days. That following week was Holy Week. I sold something big at work, went to celebrate, bought a little uh, little cocaine. They were watching his house. Next thing you know, I wind up in jail on Holy Thursday. I'm supposed to be picking up my son for my father-in-law's. My wife doesn't know where I am. They take me downtown, throw me into jail. I'm sitting there, never been in trouble in my life. Memphis has one of the worst jails in the country. It's one of the most violent cities. So I'm seeing people, just, just stuff I don't even want to repeat on here mm. in the first hour. I'm up till four in the morning taking the mug shots. I start going, I'm, everybody's going to know. My wife's telling me, I'm not, don't call me again. Mm. I wind up going to this jail cell and I'm just praying I'm alone, right? At this point, I don't want to watch my back. I go down, they open the cell door. I've got the stuff I can have in my life. The cell door slowly shuts and booms and locks. And I, and I just lay down. I throw one down on this bunk bed that's disgusting. They're telling what's on there. I lay down face first and pull the other blanket over me, and I passed out. By the grace of God, I wake up in the morning, and I think I'm, I think I'm asleep in my bed because I'm still under the covers. I sit up, and my head hits the bottom of a steel bunk bed, and I realized I was in jail. So I started having a panic attack again. I started going, no, 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 no. Everybody's going to know. Everybody's going to know. Everybody's going to know. And all of a sudden, this strange feeling came over me, this peace. I, I, it just, I get goosebumps even thinking about it. And all of a sudden, out of my own gut, I, I said, I remember hearing my voice, my own words say, at least now I don't have to lie anymore. Hmm. At least now everybody will know who I am. And it was like the weight of the world fell off of me, and I started going, how did I get here? Pretty soon, Jesus showed up. I didn't see him. He wasn't floating around or anything. But in my heart, I felt him say, it was the day that you walked away from me. And so, Keith, I hit my knees, and I... I cried and I cried and I, I remembered all the horrible things I'd said to him and I just said, Lord, I don't deserve anything and I've hated you and I, I've blamed you for things and it wasn't your fault. I'm, I'm such a mess. But all I want to do is, is be the husband and father I should have been for my wife and kids and if you'll just give me that chance, I'll give you my life. I don't know if it's worth anything. I don't know if you want it, but it's yours. Take it. I've done nothing with it. I've wasted it. I've, I've ruined everything. Please take it. A few minutes later, the bailiff came and got me. Angela showed up. She tells me in the glass, in the payphone thing, like you see in the movies, I'm not going to divorce you. It has nothing to do with you, but everything to do with the vows I made to God in the church that day. I go down to my dad's for Easter weekend. I come out of jail on Good Friday. My Angela won't let me come home. She's trying to figure things out. So I go to my dad's. My dad picks me up from jail when it was supposed to be my sister. And I'm thinking, okay, here comes the punishment, right? Because that's how he was. And I walk up expecting to like, you know, take a hit, a slap, something, a choke, a grab, a what are you doing? What were you thinking? And he grabs me by the shirt and he pulls me to him and he says, son, I love you. It's the first time in my life I remember my dad ever telling mm -hmm. me he loved me. We get in the car, we go down to the farm. He talks about my mother's death, which he had never done. He asked me if he was a terrible father and if this was his fault. I told him, no, I'm a grown man. I made my own decisions. You weren't always the dad I wanted, but who is? So we go down there. I have the desire to go to Mass for the first time in my life as a Catholic. I never went. I fought Angela on it. I was too hungover most of the time, and she felt betrayed. You know, I thought you were this man that you aren't. So I go to this little church in this small town my parents were in. We'd been one time five years before, and I would not spoken to anybody. I just went because it was Christmas. She said, if we're going there, we're going to Mass. So I pull up this church. Nobody's there. I start beating the steering wheel and going, God, really? Like, Really? The one time I'm going to Mass and nobody's and here. nobody's here. <laughs> and so this sister pulls up, and she goes, what are you doing? And I was crying like a madman. I was like, I just want to go to Mass. She probably thought I was a weirdo. And she goes, we're down the street. We have too many people. So I head down there. And there's all these people. This priest walks in from five years before. I recognize him because I remember faces. He gives this beautiful Mass. I go for the door. 
And he comes over and he grabs me on the shoulder. I didn't know who it was. I felt a hand on my shoulder. I turn around and I, I was like, who's touching me? It was this priest. And he goes, hello, John. Hmm. He knew my name and I never told him my name. And he said, I don't know why your family's here or why they're not here and why you're by yourself, but God wants me to tell you everything's going to be all right. I got in the car crying. I was like, what was that, God? What? So I go back to Memphis. I go to court, go through all my stuff. I spent a year going to you know, drug tests and parole hearings. I checked myself into rehab that day. My wife showed up there and said, I'm not going to let you go through it alone. She let me come home that night because she didn't want my dad to drive four hours every day driving me to rehab and back. And I go home and I'm fat and happy, right? I'm in my bed. I'm like air conditioning, TV, food that isn't pig slop. I'm king of the castle again. Until I looked at the bed in the bed next to me and she wasn't with me. She was in my son's bed across the hallway. And I thought, you idiot. What are you smiling at? Like, maybe you can quit drinking. Maybe you can quit doing, like, binge drinking and doing drugs. But you're still a horrible person. And so as a former Protestant, I, I felt the call to, to be close to Christ. I wanted to grab a Bible. There wasn't one on my side of the room. There were probably 40 on her side. But I wow. opened up the, <laughs> the, the drawer, and I found Father Larry Richard's book that my father-in-law had given me. And I would read three pages of five years before. I read that book from cover to cover, and it changed my life. I started going to Mass every day. I had a priest take me under his wing. He started making me go to Mass every day, confession every Friday. He, he started me on being a lector. I read 50 Catholic books in my first year. And I go a year later to this men's conference where I'd go on to confession, ready to receive it. And that night at my parish, there was a fundraising thing coming to the end in the men's group stuff here. And, and I'm in the gym. It's a three-point shootout. And this one guy was there during the day, and he goes, he's running around the gym telling everybody his sins. He hadn't been to confession in 20 years, and he went that day at the men's conference. So he's telling some stuff he shouldn't be saying in front of women and kids. I stop him. I'm like, dude, you can't say that in here. He goes, well, I don't know why I feel this way. And I said, you've had a moment with the Holy Spirit. He goes, I'm cradle Catholic. I know God. I know Jesus. I don't know the Holy Spirit. What is it? What is it? I go, well, let me tell you. And then the devil showed up, and he hit me in the back of the head. He's like, dude, what are you doing? You're a cokehead. You're a loser. You're an addict. Really? You hypocrite? You're going to talk about Jesus? The life you've lived? So I go, man, there's priests over there. Go talk to them. They can help you. Well, he was a salesman, too, and he wouldn't take no for an answer. So he asked me to meet with him that Tuesday night. I go home and tell my wife, who we're not healed, that I'm going to go tell somebody about the Holy Spirit on Tuesday night. She's like, all right. <laughs> so I get up that morning. I go to Mass. I come home, and I'm like, and that's Sunday, and I go, Lord, if you want me to do this, you got to do it for me. Next thing you know, I've got eight pages about the Holy Spirit from the Ruah over the water in Genesis through Pentecost and beyond. I show up Tuesday night, I go through it all with him, and he goes, man, that's amazing. You should start a men's group. I go, nope, not your guy. I hadn't told anybody in my life what had happened, and I'd gotten involved in the parish doing things. But I looked at him, and I go, I'm not your guy. And he goes, why? Why do you always say that? Why do you always tell me no? I had to fight you to come here. And then finally, I felt convicted, and I go, Jay, I was arrested on a felony charge of cocaine a year ago. I'm not your guy. And he goes, wow, it's amazing. You should start a men's group. Hmm. Yeah, he didn't care. No, he didn't care. He goes, dude, we're all broken. In our parish, you know what we have? A bunch of beer drinking and barbecuing. That's what we have for men, nothing else. So he convinced me. We called 30 men together in a room. I showed up that next Wednesday night, went to open the door. The devil beat on me again. You're going to embarrass your wife. They'll kick your kids out of school. They'll kick you out of this parish. Think how much pain you've already put her through. And I walked away from the door, and then the Lord showed up again and said, John, you told me you'd be different. Open the door. So I go in there. I open the door. The guys are sitting there. We didn't tell them why they were there. They what are we doing here? Where's the beer? Because that's all we did up there was drink. Mm -hmm. And I said, guys, we got a great men's club, but we never talk about Jesus. And let me tell you what can happen when that's the case. And I started crying and telling them everything. And what happened was I thought, oh, we're going to leave. But I sat down. And I said, look, I, Father wants me to start a men's group. I don't know what the heck I'm doing. I can't be the only one who's broken. I need people. And I sat down, and the guy who asked me to do it stood up first. And I thought, Shirley, you're not leaving. You got me into this. But like, I looked up, and he was crying. And he said, I care more about my job and money than I do my wife and kids by the way I spend my time. And he sat down. The next guy got up, and he goes, you all think I've got this great marriage and all this Catholic marriage you're always picking at me about it? My wife left three weeks ago. I got the papers in the mail today. She wants a divorce. I'm addicted to porn, and she's had enough. And the next guy stood up, and he goes, you all know I got nine kids. My wife and I fight. When we fight, I escape. I've been in a hotel room in downtown Memphis. I've had a case of beer today, and I drove up here. My wife thinks I'm at work. Work thinks I'm at home sick, and I drove up here because I was tired of drinking alone, and all we ever do is drink. Every man in that room, wow. every man in that room stood up like pistons at an engine, and that was the night that God showed me the power of vulnerability in a man's life. 
I got, like I told you in the beginning, we've all been told, no, put your head down, work hard, don't complain, don't have feelings, don't have emotions. Vulnerability is a weakness, right? It's it's not masculine. And so we go into these shells and we we, we self-medicate and we slowly die because the devil's a sniper and he shoots you in the stomach so you slowly bleed out. Instead, what God led me to that night was 2 Corinthians chapter 12, verse 9, when Paul's lamenting about the thorn in his Ooh, side. Yeah. And God says, he says, please remove it three times. And God says, no, my grace is sufficient for you, for my power is made perfect in weakness. And it just clicked. I was like, we're not supposed to be these robot men who don't bleed and who don't feel and who just drink it all away or pour it all away or snort it up your nose all away. It's about hitting your knees, surrendering in humility and in vulnerability and saying, I'm not God and I can't control my life and I can't do this by myself. When I did that, everything changed. And that night, that men's group was born and we've been meeting every Wednesday, every for eight years ever since. Wow. That's how we got there. Right? I, I don't know if anybody will connect with this, but, and I don't know, maybe you won't, but it reminds me of like one of my favorite movies is Fight Club. Oh yeah. And you know how in the beginning, the main character, he can't sleep. Mm-hmm. And what the only time that he can sleep is when he he becomes addicted to going to support groups yeah. for people with cancer, even though he doesn't have cancer. Sure. And there's the part of the group where everyone just like hugs each other. I remember he hugs Meatloaf. Oh and he's yeah, like yeah, there yeah. and, and he just there and they just cry. Yeah. And he's like, I have no idea why this works, but I sleep like a baby when I do this. So it's it's just kind of a it's kind of an interesting thing because I remember when I saw that, I was thinking to myself, in a weird way. You know, our experience as Christians is rooted in that weakness. Yeah. The world understands that, but the world doesn't quite know why. Yeah. But we have an answer for that, and you lived through it. Yeah. When you you were on top of the world, man, you had it all from a worldly perspective, and yet that was exactly what was putting you in a place where you, you probably wouldn't be here. Oh, yeah. If you'd have kept going. Yeah, it wouldn't be at all. But, but when you got to that point where you were broken— that's when God grabbed a holding. And I think that's such a, an important thing because here's the thing. Even in parishes and men's groups, we like to present this, this thing Facade, that yeah, we, yeah. you know, we're gonna help you put it all together. We're, you know, this is this is this is the place for guys who have their stuff together. What really we all need to recognize is none of us do. Right. We're all broken. We all need that. And and there are so few places, I think the reason why. Things like like drugs and porn are so are so prevalent in society is because they don't judge you. Right. Okay. Yeah. They don't judge you. They destroy you. Sure. But they don't care. Yeah. They're, they're not going to tell you, sorry, you're not worthy of us. Yeah. The, they're not going to judge you. And so so that becomes the 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 place where where men go to escape. But what what can happen is when you experience brokenness and you have nothing to bring to the table and you realize that you're still loved. Yeah. That's powerful, man. It is. Guys need to know that. Yes, you're a dirtbag. Yes, you've done these horrible things, but you're loved. That's the gospel. Yeah. Amen. You're loved. In spite of all, I mean, in that's, spite of your love. When Jesus, you and you don't have to stay that way. Yeah. That's, that's the right. real. Yeah. That's the beauty part. The beautiful yeah. part about our Catholic faith is that we are, we realize and recognize that the grace of God just isn't imputed to us and cover us, but we're like Martin Luther said, we yeah. are all snow covered dung heaps, yeah. right? No, we are sons of the living God yeah. who God has redeemed. And and that isn't just about, now I'm preaching here a little bit. No, that's fine. That, Bring it, that man. Is, that isn't just about, <laughs> being redeemed isn't just about going to heaven. It's about taking something that was wasted and broken and turning it into something beautiful. Yeah. That's redemption. Yeah. And that's what the Lord wants to do in the men of these church. Yeah, you're, and, and, you're right. And, and in our lives. And I think that that's a mess. I think the, one of the reasons, John, why I think you are experiencing people that want you to come and do this in their church is because really that's what we all know should be happening, but we haven't figured out how to crack that code. Yeah. We're still playing church up here yeah. when, when Jesus wants to change lives and redeem people. That's right. And, and that's why I always lead when we go do these missions. The first talk I give is my conversion story. Yeah. And, I mean, people ask me all the time, do you have an onion in your pocket? Do you Can you cry and command like an actor? I'm like, no, it hurts. Because I remember how I talked to my wife. I remembered what kind of person I was. And though I'm not that person anymore— because I've been redeemed, I can talk about that and have a freedom to share that yeah. through that vulnerability. But I open with that because people think, 
God can't use me. God can't do anything with me. You don't know what I've done. Look at St. Paul. I mentioned him a couple of times in this. He murdered people. He murdered people. And Jesus said, I don't care. I want you. Because Jesus doesn't care about what you've done. He cares about what you have the potential to do. The only time he ever cares about what you've done is when you refuse to repent of it because it could potentially separate you from him forever. That's why he cares. And we look at, like, even confession will go as men. Men will say all the time, I go, why don't you go to confession? Well, I don't know. I don't want God to know what I've done. Really? He knows, dude. <laughs> he loved you into existence. And when he did, he knew what you were going to do before you were ever born. And he still chose to, to create you. So what does that tell you? He's not worried about the falls. He's worried about the getting back up again. It's not about hitting the mat. It's about getting up. And that's what so many men, we, we shame ourselves to the point, and we and we have these father wounds. We, we've had bad relationships with our dad or sports you know, coaches or male figures in our life. And so we just automatically assume that's who God is. God's this cosmic police officer in the cloud somewhere that's writing down everything I've done wrong, and he can't wait to send me to hell when I die. That's not who God is. He's the God of the prodigal son parable, right? Who rushes out to meet you, who's been waiting. I love that parable when he says, when it says in there, uh, the father saw the son coming from a long way off. Yeah, he was he, far. He, he wasn't just him. sitting there going like, oh, here comes that moron I happen to see on the horizon. He sat there waiting for him to return every single day. And that's what God does. He waits in that confessional going like, I don't care. I care because you're hurting and you're broken and you need me. And he allows us to get to these places to where we're stripped of everything but him. We and have, we have one place to, to turn to him. And then what he does, he goes, now watch what I can do with your life. Amen. Boom. I love that. That's a, And that's, that's beautiful. That's what I love about it is like, you know, our brokenness is what allows God to work through us. Yeah. And that's a different paradigm than, hey, here are the rules. Keep them. Here, here are here's what it means to be a good Christian man. Do the right things, or go feed the hungry, or do what you know all that good stuff, which is fine. Yeah. But th that needs to come from a place of God working in and through you. But what really requires that is that we become broken. Yeah. And I can't remember who who said this, but it could have been in a movie or something. But it was it was basically these guys were, I think it was in a church that I was talking to. These guys were looking to hire somebody for their for their their pastor, and they wanted somebody with a story. Yeah. They wanted somebody who'd been broken because they had. Oh, that's exactly what it was. It was a friend of mine who they were they were they were candidating for a new senior pastor, and they were interviewing all these guys that were coming in, and all these guys were coming in with their stacked resumes and oh, all sure. of their successes and their you know nice accolades, their accolades, oh, yeah. and all of the great things, and it was just like boom, 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 boom. But these guys were just like nope. We, we want a guy, you know, these guys, they they haven't experienced brokenness, and we need a pastor who understands that. Yeah. Because that's who we're trying to reach. Yeah. And, you know, I, I, I love when when we hear stories about, about that because it reminds all of us that there's hope. Yeah. Because the reality is every single one of us has layers of brokenness in our hearts, and sometimes we just feel like we have to mask them or cover them up. But when we see somebody like you who can can share about that and talk about that, you know, it, it gives us the freedom to share about that too. Yeah. And to not feel like I have to cover that up. And I think that that's what men's groups ultimately need to be. Now, it isn't just a bunch of men sitting around crying all day long. Sure. But but it, but those relationships where men can be real, can be known, and still loved. Yeah. I'm telling you, if if the church could connect that on a global level. We wouldn't have this feminized version of Christianity that yeah. so permeates the Catholic Church in America. Amen. We wouldn't have that. It wouldn't it wouldn't appear the way it appears. You know, no disrespect to the women, but like uh, one of the reasons why a lot of men don't want to come to church is because they look around and it doesn't look like any other place that they would want to be. Yeah. Amen. You know? Yeah. And and part of the reason is because the men aren't there. Yeah. And so who's left? Right? It, it, it turns into a place where they feel like, I don't belong. But when you show a man that he can be known, that he can be real, and that he can still be loved, you, you set him free and you yeah. set him loose. Well, and he, he's found a place he can belong. Yeah. And that's what everybody's looking for is I want to belong. And I don't want to just belong as a, as a card-carrying member of something. I want people to know me. I want to belong because people love me and they want me here. Amen. And when you build those places, man, it just changes everything. In our parish— 
there was nothing for women. And then my wife, who's an introvert, I never thought she would do this in her life. She started a women's group because the women said, I don't know what you're doing in there to my husband, but he's different. And he has friends now when he's never had friends before. And his life has changed. I want that. So a women's group started out of that. Mm. They use the same format we do. And then a youth group started because kids go, mom has something and dad has something. I want something too. And this is the thing. When men lead, I, I can't tell you how many women write in our podcast all the time. And they've said, You're, we listened to an episode and it saved our marriage. My husband and I were about, I was about to leave him. But something clicked. And I'm not trying to say it, look at me. But there are so many women that pray all the time for their husbands because they know they're struggling. They mm -hmm. don't know with what. They know they're hurting. People go, why do you bring, if you do men's ministry, why do you invite women? Why is it a parish-wide mission? Because women are the best at putting their hand, their elbows in their husband's ribs and going, I don't know what it is, but you have something. And this sounds like it could help you. And this is what we're looking for, man. Our church is supposed to be a field hospital. I love always talking about Isaiah 61. To me, that's the gospel, right? The Spirit of the Lord God is, a, uh, is upon me. I've been, I've been anointed and sitting here to, to heal the brokenhearted, to set free the captives, right? To loose those who mourn. All of these things, it's just like every time I read that, the hair on my arm stands up because that's not just for Jesus. Jesus does it for us, but then we have the full right through his grace and through his mercy and through his love to go do that for someone else. And we live in such a self-centered world now that it's all about me and, and everything for me. And we've turned away from loving our neighbor. And men think it's like, well, I can't do that. I, my dad told me, you know, no affection, no. That's mm -hmm. junk. Get it out of your head. What did Jesus say? Love one another. Lay down your life for one's friends. Right? This is the message of the gospel. And what you find is the, is the virtue and the heroicism you're looking for. That's why these men are lined up for every Marvel movie that comes out. Guys stay in line for hours because they see this call, but they don't realize the same thing is said at Mass every week when Jesus yeah. is telling you to lay down your life. So there's this something inside that knows that it's made for more, right? But then I, I don't ever engage in that because I believe the lies of the evil one. And when we're alone and we don't have anybody to help us preach the truth to ourselves, then we just become slaves of the devil. Mm. And we get off in all this stuff. So what we're trying to do is build these places where men can recognize those lies in each other and help each other and learn about our faith and grow. Jesus sent out the disciples two by two for a reason. He knew one of them might fall and there was another one there to pick them up. And so, therefore, that's what we're trying to do in the church and restore men to go, look, it's not unmanly to, to tell somebody I'm struggling. It's not unmanly to say that, that you're so wrecked that you can't even put words together some days. Mm. Like, I, I told you before this, I've had six friends that have taken their life in the last five years, either by drinking too much, by drug abuse, or by sticking a gun in their mouth because they simply believed that they were too broken, there was no chance for them, that there was no redemption in their life, and there was no hope. And our society is full of that. You look at it, opioid abuse is higher than it's ever been, drug abuse, divorce, pornography, suicide. It's because the church doesn't have places for these people that are hurting to come to. And so... I don't know how far we'll get and how long we can do this or how long the church will even want it, but I'll spend the rest of my days giving these missions and going and setting up these places in parishes because I'm tired of men silently suffering and the devil winning because it's destroying families, it's destroying society, and I'm sick of it. Hmm. Dude, wow. Well, tell tell everybody what they can do to get connected with you, man. <laughs> yeah, I mean, sorry. I feel man. like we, no, I love it, yeah. I love it. But I, I, want, I want to make sure that people know how they can yeah. can make this happen in their parish because you'll go there and you'll you'll yeah. work this process. So yeah. tell, tell us where we can find your podcast, your sure. resource, and how how can a, a a priest or somebody reach out and say, hey, let's make this happen. Sure. Thanks, man. Thanks for the opportunity Absolutely. and being on here and getting this platform to share this. You're the first your one, brother. Yeah, I know. I know. You may regret that at some point, but <laughs> but, but anyway, okay, you want to hear the podcast, you can hear it on any podcast platform, Apple, iTunes, whatever you're listening to. It's on there, Spotify, all those things. We have a YouTube channel. All of it's just a guy in the pew. So just look up just a guy in the pew. We have a YouTube channel. You can subscribe to it. We have weekly podcasts that come out there, some other talks and things I've given. Uh, we have guests on. You've been on and some things like that, some other folks. But if you want to get into the ministry piece, we just changed our whole website away from John Edwards Catholic Speaker and Podcast because I don't give a lick about Catholic celebrity at all or any of that stuff. We changed it to, this is just a guy on the pew. This is the issue for men. This is the need, and this is how we're dealing with it. So you can go to our website on the homepage. You don't have to search for it. 
It'll tell you all these statistics I've shared. You can click start, uh, start a men's group or find out more. It'll fill out a form. Once you do, you also have an option to set up a Calendly call with me. So you're not going to get somebody else. You'll talk to me. And I'll get on a call with you and say, what's your story? What are you dealing with? Tell me about your parish. We'll build a plan with a priest, a DRE, a deacon, whoever it is. And we'll walk with you from the moment that you that God puts the desire in your heart. We'll give you the tools to be able to do it. We'll come to your parish, put boots on the ground, and go in your place and walk with you there. And then we'll sustain you and support you for as long as you need it. So you can do all that at justagodinthepew.com. Uh, that's where you can sign up for everything. And you can send me an email if you need to at justagodinthepew at gmail.com. Dude, awesome, awesome. Well, I can't wait for tomorrow to get to hear you share with these yeah. men. And, I mean, this is my diocese, so, so I have some skin in the game here. And I, I'm like, yeah, we need this, you know. <laughs> um, and I would love nothing more than to see this kind of take off here. So yeah. I'm, I'm pumped, man. I'm well, pumped. Thanks. Please play yeah. for me tomorrow and for our ministry to move forward. We we The idea is to one day hire missionaries and to bring people in to train and go out and do this on a mass scale so we can really get the men back in the right place. Well, listen, I want you tomorrow just to— just let it all go because yeah. after you're done, you're going to eat the best pork butt you've ever had in your life. <laughs> uh, uh, we're I'm smoking it here. It. It's yeah. going to be awesome, and then uh, we'll have a great time. But man, yeah. what a what a what a powerful story you have! And John, yeah. I just want to thank you for your friendship, man. You and I have been buddies for a couple of years now, but this yeah. is the first time we ever got to sit face to face. So thank you for for making the time to come here. I mean, you have a lot going on. You had a yeah. crazy day of travel today, and yeah, you, you came straight from the airport that you weren't even supposed to go to an hour and a half away, and you came straight to my house <laughs> yeah. to hang out when you probably could have just gone to the hotel and crashed. Yeah, so man, I love thank you, you, Thank you for taking time, and uh, it's been an honor, and I, I, I want all of you guys to, you know, check out John's stuff and and take a chance and and, and say something to your, your priest. Get in there to your parish and get this going. Guys need it. There could be guys in your parish right now that are just one step away from just losing everything. Yeah. So so let's not let that happen. Let's get these guys on track. And I, I think in no better way than, than bringing Johnny to do that. So, brother, yeah. thank you so thank much. Thank you, man. man. Absolutely. Peace. God bless. Yeah, God bless.